Continuing our conversation with Dr. Peter Iltis, Principal Investigator of the MRI Horn Studies, we get to the topic of tonguing. And, and first off, I have a uh, sort of a side point, but it relates to this. For slurs, Barkas says, a smooth legato was made with the lips while the air remains steady. Mm -hmm. However, just from the, the videos I've seen, it's clear that the tongue has a bit of motion between notes on legato notes. Um, how common is this? And I've been aware of this personally for years, but I've never seen this mentioned in any brass text. Sure. Well, I mean, there's a couple of ways to look at, look at this. Uh, one would be to look at slurs between notes and how you move through the harmonic series, say. We've done quite a bit of imaging with that. And uh, conclusively, the tongue pulsates. It pulsates with each note change, and uh, particularly when you get to the upper harmonics, the tongue rises anteriorly and superiorly, up and forward in the mouth. So there's, there's clearly a pulsing that goes on, and, and, and I, would, I would liken these two little boosts of air column that are helping to make the transition. And if you look at yeah. the larynx, you'll find the same thing. There's some movement there. So this notion of a non non-dynamic air column is not correct. It's, it's definitely changing with each note change, John. Yeah, no, it's like you could, it'd be impossible actually to, to not pulsate just slightly. I know you yeah. don't want to hear like wah, wah, right. wah, but, right. but you really can't blow straight through and just like push a valve down. It just doesn't sound right. Yeah. Um, but this gets at, so the underlying legatos, you've got this pulsate, I like that word, pulsations of the tongue. Uh -huh. And that gets towards tonguing, yep. which is kind of a, a similar action. Yeah. Um, and now to tonguing itself first, even from the old x-ray videos that have been on YouTube for a while, it's clear the description of tonguing in Farkas is, is really not very correct. He speaks of a common fault, quote unquote, being the tongue moving forwards and backwards and suggests that the tongue works best by curling the tip up and working in the motion up and down. I believe this instruction has caused problems for people, actually. It, it, it's not very correct, I don't believe, and it's kind of sort of the opposite of what people do, as, as I'm, as what it seems to me. Yeah. Well, we haven't done any systematic measurements and assessments of tonguing, but I've certainly seen thousands of tongues moving inside people's mouths with these MRI videos. And, and you know, the motion typically is sort of a, a, an oblique motion where the tongue will go forward and where it contacts the front of the mouth, that might vary a little bit from subject to subject, but I think we're seeing some standard things there. And by the way, my colleague Eli Epstein really wants to look at this closely because, as you know in his book, he talks about different tongue positions relative to the pitch that you're playing. Well, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just preface that study by saying it's not as clear as, as perhaps we have thought in the past, but the point is the tongue moves to make contact usually right behind where the teeth and the gums connect. People have said that for years to varying degrees. And then when it retracts, when it withdraws, it comes down and back. So it's, it's a movement which is not simply up and down, nor is it simply forward and backward. It's a touching with a retraction where the actual tongue muscle itself moves down and compacts, moving back in the mouth as though you're compressing an elongated structure a little bit. That's pretty much what we see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now related to this, now there's a mantra in Farkas to not tongue between the lips. Uh -huh. um, but there's another school of thought which says that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I think it's kind of context based as much as anything. Um, uh, what, what observations have you made on that? Well, um, again, with my colleague Eli Epstein, who's very much a proponent of moving the tongue within the mouth to, to tongue different, very, in a very restricted way. I've got to be careful how I say that. I don't want to misrepresent him at all. But um, it's clear that uh, the tongue will at times, in some people, move slightly lower and be closer to being between the lips. It, ha it happens, or between the teeth is almost rather where I'd like to say it is. And uh, the, t the trouble here, John, is that our kinesthetic perception of where our tongue is touching is really, I think, biased by our opinions. If you look... The tip of the tongue is not this discrete little thing that just points and touches at a certain point. It's a mass. The front of your tongue, the entire front of the tongue, uh, in fact, Eli and I have called it the smush of the tongue as it comes forward and contacts either the tongue or the top of the roof of the mouth, wherever it's contacting. 
it's it's a fairly large area and you have to yeah think, i've yeah. It, it seems to me it's kind of a flat area often well, for people too like the tip is like in a certain place but there's more contact than just the tip definitely it's like definitely contacting across the back of the teeth definitely and when you think about the the neural sensory information that's being processed there um, there's a thing called the, the homunculus, which is a map of the brain showing how much of the brain is dedicated to sensory information from the various parts of our body. The tongue has huge representation. And my, my comment would be, you're getting a lot of sensory information from many, many receptors on the tongue that you will interpret based upon what you tend to focus on. So you may think that you're tonguing higher up on the roof of the mouth or lower, but that may simply be where your attention is focused relative to this smush, this not flat, but smushed part of the tongue that's touching. I, there's a lot more to be done with that, John, and we're going to have some interesting papers to come out on that in the future. Yeah, this this is a big topic because I, I think, again, it's like people hear something on paper and they just, it's not physiological reality right. and they can kind of get themselves in a loop of of issues. Yep. Um, related to that, we have the topic of staccato. Right which we were getting on a little bit in part one. So Farkas states that you should never, ever cut off notes with the tongue. Mm -hmm. Which, so, and that's one of those things like, you know, you hear it all the time, but, you know, how, in certain contexts, very fast staccato notes, how else are you going to make it short? I mean, what's, what's the... What's your observation? Well, I think I think the speed of tonguing makes all the difference in the world. And, you know, um, when you're tonguing extremely fast with single tonguing, absolutely. You have, I always have liked the idea of a flowing stream of water with a knife just kind of cutting across, you know, making those notes stop. I'm sure the tongue is stopping fast staccato notes. I, I can't imagine any other way to do it. All the staccato notes that we complain about, though, that we hear sometimes, are when the tongue stops the note with just short notes. T -t -t when you're just doing simple staccato notes that aren't fast. There, we have a lot of choices in my view as right. to how to touch. We can use well, the you tongue. You were getting at that we, last we, time because the glottis and everything, right? Well, let's just talk about that. Um, again, with Sarah Gillespie, uh, we did some work there in Gettingen, Germany. And... Again, we had a problem because we were looking at staccato notes that were changing. And so we were losing some of the real good resolution to be able to say precisely when things happen. But I can now conclusively say, based upon our improved techniques, that at least with the subjects we've looked at so far, the glottis closes and terminates the end of a short staccato note. It is what happens. And the sound begins with the glottis opening. So there is definite glottal closure that makes it short. And Eli and I have talked about this quite a bit. And, you know, if you just simply say, ta, ta, a short puff of air, you don't keep your throat open and just stop the flow of air. The glottis closes. And so um, I think we've shown this quite clearly, and you'll be getting some reading about that in journals very soon. Yeah, no, this is, is, is what is, has always seemed to me to be is what has to be happening. I, I, what I felt is you have an ability to shade toward the tongue cutting it off or the glottis cutting it off. Yep. And it's just you're looking for a, mul a musical result. You're not really thinking it all out right. mechanically. Right. But you definitely get... With the glottis stop, it's softer. Oh, yeah. The uh, the end of it because it's further away from your lips. Yeah. And it's just not as uh, exactly. And I yeah. think you know for for uh, beginning students who can have a terrible time with getting a good quality staccato, just this notion of informing them and getting to think about you know you don't have to close your throat, but if you just go t uh, yeah t uh, you can tell what's happened and you can feel that. And uh, anyway, it's been been interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, as a final little uh, tonguing point here, just for anybody watching, uh, Farkas does not address multiple tonguing, but obviously your MRI videos right. do, and I just highly recommend anyone interested check out those videos yeah. to see them and get some more about that. i um, got a few more things I'd like to talk about. We'll go to a part three for those. So first, thank again, Dr. Peter Ilses, for joining us. You're welcome. And thank you for checking out the Horn Notes video podcast and be watching for more episodes on a variety of topics. Awesome.